Today, I prepared a presentation by the name uh, Hacking and Tracking with uh, CSS. Uh, thank you all for uh, coming and uh, to see this presentation. Uh, my name is Marek Hensel. Uh, at the beginning, I would like to uh, go and summarize uh, the symbolism and explain a little bit the, the title. Uh, then I would like to do a, a little part which will be live and interactive, so uh, do a little uh, quiz where uh, uh, hopefully all of you will uh, participate. Uh, afterwards, we will look at some uh, results uh, from this uh, quiz. And lastly, I will look at some, uh, some code and some things you can see with uh, uh, CSS and, and some basic uh, uh, HTML, uh, HTTP uh, fundamentals. So uh, when I talk about uh, hacking, hackers, uh, I mean, in today's uh, world, uh, hacking has a very negative connotation. Each time you look on the news, uh, uh, the company was hacked, the data was stolen by hackers, uh, the hackers did a DDoS attack, uh, the, the hackers um, uh, stole some, uh, some money. Um, uh, and yes, uh, hacking did have a, con a negative connotation uh, back in uh, 95. Uh, here's an example of my first uh, Linux uh, book. I got it in uh, 97. And uh, what I really like is the definition of uh, uh, hacking uh, that used to be, where, where hacking wasn't associated with uh, this uh, negative uh, uh, damaging somebody, uh, uh, but it was more associated with uh, sort of, sort of a, a, a philosophy. Uh, when I uh, think about uh, hacking, or I like the definition here, is uh, hacking is how one approaches any activity in life, uh, not just in dealing with computers. Yeah, so. So I, I think it's, it's, to a certain extent, a, a way people think about uh, addressing certain type of problems. Uh, another part of the definition is uh, uh, to learn everything there is to know uh, about a system, becoming uh, uh, to a point of distraction. Um, I, I think all of you uh, probably have the experience where, where you look out of the window, it's, 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 it's sunny, it's day, then you know, a little bit later you, you look down at the clock, you know, it's two, three o'clock in the morning, and it's like, wow, where did the uh, time, time go? And um, uh, uh, what, what hacking to, to me is, is, is really uh, to, to know everything there is to know about um, a system. So, this is a little bit of thoughts on, on, the, on the hacking part of, uh, of the title. If I jump over hacking and tracking with CSS, and, and I talk about CSS, uh, I'm thinking here about uh, using the fundamentals, using the, using the basics, uh, 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 utilizing the, 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 the core function, yeah? something without bells and whistles, uh, something that is consistently uh, reliable. Uh, oftentimes, I, I, I think of uh, the guys or, or gals who first uh, put some voltage to uh, uh, quartz crystals. Sure, it, it started oscillating, you know, it was uh, oscillating, oscillating, they disconnected it, nothing happened, they, they connected voltage, it oscillated, but after a while it becomes really boring. I mean, what do you do with oscillating? What do you do with up and down, up and down, ones and zero? It's, uh, it's really boring. But if you think about some of the applications and, and think about what it's actually doing and then, then utilizing the, the, the basics, you can find out that there is uh, some uh, uh, interesting usage of how to use something that is uh, um, boring and, uh, and overlooked. Uh, uh, when, what I'm talking about is something that is easy to, to implement, something that is not complicated and even in today's world we have a lot of uh, uh, let's say technology that is built on technology so so one thing is to use frameworks and, and, and use somebody else's work but what if you step back and, and, and really use the the basics and, and see what you can do with uh, with the basics hacking and tracking with CSS when, when, when I think about tracking I think about uh, not the corporate type of tracking where uh, the Facebook's the, the Google's all the big corporates uh, spend tons of money on not only collecting the data but uh, and analyzing the data but I, but I think about a one-to-one -one, uh, interaction or one to uh, many uh, interaction um, 
I mean, we're all used to the, the body language. Uh, when we talk to somebody, we, we, we see when somebody's being protected or, or you know, they don't really want to talk about the issue. Or if, if they don't want to talk at all, they, they turn their back. Um, you know, if, if they're not sure or, or nervous, they scratch their head. Uh, in a similar way, um, metadata can be used to uh, get a feel for the digital body language. And um, uh, metadata shows how people connect to, uh, to technologies. If, if they communicate to somebody, they still connect through that technology. And through metadata, you can get the, the interaction. Sure, you do not get the content of uh, what is being done, but you get the uh, feel of the intensity uh, how, or of a vector. Do they communicate uh, more, more and more, or are they starting to ease off on the communication? It, it, it shows the engagement of, uh, of the actual inter interaction. Um, the thing with metadata compared to the, the typical day-to-day -day, uh, human react, uh, interaction is that you can put a timestamp on it. And, and, and you can go back and, and you not only can capture it and, and aggregate it and, and transform the, the data, uh, you can put on algorithms, uh, you can measure it, uh, and you can interpret it. And, and then you can get some stories from uh, some very basic uh, metadata, uh, you get the information that tell you a story of what is happening uh, uh, on the other side or, or what is happening in the interaction for example, uh, when communicating with, uh, with somebody. Uh, last uh, point uh, before we go into the uh, interactive part is uh, uh, the data. Where, where is your data? Yeah, of, of, of course it's in the cloud. You, you want to have it accessible from different devices, from different locations, and, and, and you want to have that, uh, that data accessible. But the question is really, how much control of the data you have, and, and is the data with you, or is the data with somebody else? Yeah. So if the data is with a, a free uh, third-party service provider, well, that means they're probably using the data somehow to pay for their, their costs. Yeah? If, if you have the data with a, a paid uh, service provider, uh, you typically would expect that the data is not being, uh, that you're not the product and the data is not being uh, used, uh, used to, to analyze and, and uh, to find out more and more about you. Uh, uh, you know, is, is the data with you? I used to have uh, uh, the data under, under my bed. I, I love raspberries, I'll, I'll pull them out a little bit later, but you know, uh, how safe can your data be when, when you have the cloud uh, basically in your, uh, in your premises uh, as close to, uh, to, your, to you as, uh, as possible? And the question, of course, is what, what is happening with the data, yeah? Is, is, is somebody running algorithms on it? Uh, uh, or are you running the algorithms on these data and, and, and uh, bringing value to what, uh, what the data uh, has, yeah? So this is a little bit of a sort of introduction to some of the topics that what I'm about to discuss and show uh, will uh, uh, basically interact uh, uh, through. So the, let's go to the live and uh, interactive uh, presentation. Let's talk about uh, passwords. Uh, today, I have uh, brought my own uh, cyber, cyber lab. Yeah, I have it booted up. Uh, basically, it's uh, Raspberry. Um, I expect uh, uh, anybody who doesn't know Raspberry, raise your hand. So uh, the thing I love about raspberries is they're, they're small, uh, they're uh, portable, they're uh, uh, Linux, uh, Linux based. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I, ju I just have a lot of, uh, a lot of play, play time with them and, and try to do different, uh, uh, different tricks. So um, a few years back, I uh, developed my own uh, cyber lab and uh, the cyber lab was because I wanted to start uh, uh, training some high school and some uh, elementary students about uh, advanced uh, computer 
uh, knowledge, uh, basically show them Linux, uh, uh, show them what is happening with the packets as they travel uh, from their PC to, to a website, show them if you don't uh, encrypt, how you can easily grab uh, the, the login data and uh, 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 be able to know the, the passwords. And uh, one of the problems that I ran into is that whenever I come into a school, uh, I used to bring a USB live key and, and, and you know, I give out these uh, USB live keys and everybody has to reboot the Windows computer into, uh, into Linux and, and it typically took 15, 20 minutes to get everybody going because you had to go through the BIOS and then you had to reset it so it would boot from the USB, so on and so forth. And uh, uh, in the end I said, well, this is losing too much time, uh, there's updates, there's just uh, too much hassle, why don't I basically bring the technology to, to the class, uh, basically bring a, bring a gateway router where I have uh, the network all set up, I can just connect up uh, raspberries, give, out, give them out to the class, and, and the only thing that the students have to do is uh, uh, basically plug in the monitor and, and uh, put in the um, default user, user password and, and uh, off, off they go. So basically the concept is to have a, a lab anywhere you go and uh, uh, it's, it's mobile, it's small, um, it's on, based on Linux, so that's, that's, why I'm, uh, that's why I'm here. It's good for educating some advanced uh, concepts and uh, here I decide to use it for, uh, for our presentation. So each, each of you have a, uh, or should have a piece of paper on, on your desks on the back side. Uh, you, have a, um, you have a comics. And uh, then on the front side, we have uh, some uh, some login uh, some login information. So before I go on, uh, please raise your hand if you have uh, iPhone. Okay, so maybe ten. Uh, how many of you have uh, Android? Okay, that's about eighty. Uh, that's I guess what I would uh, would expect with uh, IT IT crowd. Uh, anybody has a grandma phone? Oh, okay, I think uh, you and I will be friends. Yeah. So, uh, um, yeah, uh, one way to go is uh, with the grandma phone. Uh, I guess you won't be able to participate. Uh, so, uh, uh, this lab, the, w the way I have set up, basically what I, what I did, I brought my own uh, server, uh, basically my own network, my Wi-Fi. Uh, I brought the, the battery, so I mean it has three components. I got it powered. Uh, uh, the technology, I have the server, and then I have the uh, Wi-Fi. Now, if I can ask you, uh, please uh, turn off uh, um, uh, uh, data on your, on your mobile. For those uh, uh, who do not have a uh, uh, smartphone, you can try and connect uh, with, uh, with your laptop and uh, find uh, the uh, Wi-Fi access point uh, 2G server Wi-Fi. And... Uh, uh, here you have the uh, password, all small uh, Linux days. And uh, when you uh, connect uh, to, to the Wi-Fi, then in the URL, uh, you can either uh, type in the IP address, so 192.168.101, uh, uh, or you can maybe just type uh, test.cz. Uh, I have a few. Uh, few different uh, uh, domains there. Uh, the reason you want to turn off your, your data is uh, so that uh, uh, basically the DNS, uh, because we are offline, this is, this is very much uh, just accessible in this uh, room, is that you can access uh, basically the server without the DNS on your mobile uh, trying to route you to, uh, to the internet. So uh, who, has, uh, who has connected? And you have, if you have connected, you probably got a page to wait for, uh, for everybody uh, to, to log on before we do the, uh, we do the survey. So uh, for those who haven't uh, connected up uh, here, have you had a chance to connect up? You're connected up, okay. So uh, I guess uh, if you connect up, uh, we should probably see something like See if this works. So don't press anything. So uh, uh, please go ahead and uh, go through the qu uh, quick quiz. And uh, I have three uh, questions uh, uh, about passwords. And then uh, at uh, uh, the end, 
uh, before you send it off, each of you on uh, the page have an uh, anonymous code. So if you can enter your anonymous code and uh, uh, send uh, the uh, um, uh, survey or, or, or the uh, questions or the answers to the, to the questions, and then afterwards we will have a quick look at, uh, at the results. Anybody has uh, problems uh, connecting? If you, yeah? What? 404, quick quiz. Uh, I think it's, it was quickquiz.lab. Uh, yeah, or, or, or try putting in test.cz. Okay. Well, I, I whipped it up a little bit, uh, a little bit quicker, so uh, I can't uh, guarantee that there's not some uh, some bugs or uh, or errors. Um, but let's look what we have. So, wow, I see. Uh, thank you very much. We have a lot of uh, people who have connected. So, uh, one of the nice things to uh, have this lab is, for example, you can look into uh, what is happening on the access point on the. Uh, on the microtech, and uh, uh, I see we gave out, I know, 60, uh, 60 or so uh, IP addresses. Yeah. Uh, the part of uh, the test that I want to look at, let's see if we have it here. I think hopefully it should be big enough. So uh, I put a little together a very very quick script. So I see 36 of you have uh, have answered the uh, the quiz. Um, I know maybe I give you 10, 15 more uh, seconds to have a look at it, and uh, then we can go over the uh, the results and uh, the uh, the findings. So I mean. The, the, the password questionnaire, it's, 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 it's sort of basic, but the idea is that you think about the, the context and uh, that maybe there is more right answers than, uh, uh, than what, 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 what you're thinking. So out of this, the crowd, uh, the answers to, to the quiz was uh, we had, uh, of course, everybody said Heslo is a bad one. Uh, we have uh, six of you who said uh, the, the second UA Big Y, X, uh, little Y is is better one. Then 14 of you identified that the third answer is uh, is uh, is pretty good. And then uh, uh, 28 uh, said that Shkola is, is is the best one. Now, for those who said Shkola, I would have to uh, say that I uh, disagree with you. And 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 the reason I disagree. Well, on one hand, it, it, it's a good password because I have some characters that I don't typically have, and, and, and the combination of, of characters is basically increased by using the diacrit diacritic, diacritica. Uh, on the other hand, it's, it's, it's a bad password because if you're not on your device, and uh, uh, you, know, you, you ask a foreigner, can I log into my uh, uh, utility, uh, you might find out you don't have a uh, sh on your, uh, on your device. Yeah? So, so I think uh, uh, one way to look at it is what is the context of me using the passwords. And, and for, for me, I think the best password is the, the, the third one, Peppa Adam Novak. And even though that might be your name, I mean, it's, it's the longest string. You get the small letters, big letters, and, and you get the special characters by the, uh, by the space. So, so you fulfill three out of the four typical uh, character types. Yeah? So that's the answer number one. Let's look at the answer number uh, two is, uh, you know, how many passwords to use. Uh, here, I guess there's some outliers for you know using one one password or m maybe they're jokers, uh, or, or we have uh, you know used three or five, not too many enough to 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 remember. Uh, yeah, sure. Forty. Most of you say yeah. I I like to use different passwords for different application. I agree. Uh, on the other hand, it starts to get a little bit, a uh, little bit crowded when when you have 40 different applications and you don't use some key pass or or or, or, or some uh, password tool to to keep it all organized. So, 
Uh, yeah, but uh, generally, yeah, the critical applications, you know, you use a unique password, and then the uh, tools or applications where you log in once a while, sure, you can use a one universal one. So if somebody breaks into some marketing, we just ordered it to, to get some document, then, then that's fine. And let's look at the number, uh, number three. Uh, and the question is, uh, how frequently to, ch to change your, your password? Uh, depending on where you, where you work, uh, maybe you work in a state uh, um, government uh, institution, well there maybe they force you to, to do a new password every three months or every six months, but then you, you fall into a pattern and, and you of course increment. Uh, uh, of course, you change your password when uh, when the password has has you have identification it leaked, or, or maybe you have suspicion, or or, or maybe you think that uh, it's time to change it because you already had it five years, and maybe it's a good idea to to try some uh, some other password. So this is sort of a summary how how everybody in the uh, here uh, answered, and, and and to give you a little bit perspective of what some of your colleagues uh, are 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 thinking, and. Um, Thank you very much for uh, for joining. Now let's look. I also had a part that I used to do simil something similar with, with schools, where I basically teach them about the passwords, and and then I tell the students, okay, now put in a password that's you know strong that you you've learned uh, learned uh, some lessons from it. Um, but today, uh, let's see if uh, if anybody has uh, answered. And uh, let's see which one is it. So there are some some of you who who gave me some some passwords, uh, uh, who who were nice enough to uh, to type it in. Um, I, I I did this presentation in in a, a, a longer uh, form. I know maybe five, six, seven times. The, the, the thing that strikes me is typically nobody really uh, is concerned that, that they've actually sent the information on unencrypted, yeah? Because the server, if I had a certificate on here, you would have to click, uh, you know, self-signed certificate. Uh, typically just people click, click away. So, so one of the normal takeaway lessons is, yeah, please also think about, you know, are you really sending it encrypted or, or, or not? And, uh, uh, um, yeah, uh, take 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 away that you should think about is who has access to uh, to the passwords. So this morning I was uh, working on some uh, short scripts and uh, I was uh, thinking. Let's see, what? So this is 220. So, Vojtapal is sitting in the fifth row, probably number seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Somewhere, is Vojtapal somewhere in that area? Oh, yeah. So, um, we, we, can, we can try and try another one. Uh, let's see. So, that's 205. And second row seven, so that's right there. So one of the things that's that's sort of nice is is, is you can take your cyber lab, you, you can prepare some some script, you can do a little bit of social social engineering. Uh, and, and you can basically, it's not the way it used to be, uh, but a lot of iPhone users, they of course uh, put in their first name and then and you can call out, you know, uh, Toniku, you're sitting over there and uh, uh, you, you can really drive home uh, how you can use metadata. I mean, this is the biggest crowd, twice, three times as big as I've done before, but even in this crowd, I can more or less pick out who roughly answered uh, what, uh, because, of course, everybody was nice enough to put in the, the code. Um, 
Uh, and uh, uh, of course, it's not so important to go into all the details of the stuff you can see, but, but I think you, you, get the, you get the idea. Basically, what we have, we have a lot of uh, data packets, and, and all you need is, is just some grep and uh, awk, and, and uh, uh, you can basically pull out some, uh, some information. So, so this is uh, the, the live and interactive part uh, I want to talk about is how with uh, basically no JavaScripts, uh, um, no, no frameworks, uh, you can still get relatively interesting intelligence and, and visibility into what, uh, uh, what is happening on the, on the other side. Uh, one of the things I'm, I'm working on or, or, or towards is uh, basically doing um, uh, self-hosting services. Yeah, so uh, long term, I have very strong philosophy. I want to have the data with, with me. I want to have control of the data. Why should I give the data somewhere else and, and have somebody uh, the uh, ability to take that data? Uh, I mean, if I can't touch the hardware, then, then uh, having control of the data is only only virtual when i have the data here it's up to me if uh, if i properly back it up if i properly uh, secure it uh, and and if i lose it well then it's mainly my fault it's it's not uh, the unfortunate uh, circumstance that somebody turned off the service and then basically or decided not to erase your your data so uh, uh, maybe a shout out uh, to you um, i think you have my my contacts if if uh, this is interesting and and, and self hosting is a top Topic that uh, uh, catches your eye and something where you would like to uh, also uh, evolve, and, and then please uh, contact me uh, anytime after after the show. Um, what uh, what I basically uh, have set up is, um, or, or what I like to. Uh, have is, is a full control of, of, of the stack. Yeah? So, so if you think of the OSI model, the communication, on the bottom you have the physical layer, on top you have the application, in between you have uh, different uh, uh, functional, uh, functional layers. Uh, well, this is sort of similar except thinking with, uh, with the servers and operating systems. Uh, but the thing that uh, I think is important is to have control of the IP, have control of, uh, of the domain, and basically be able to have the traffic uh, routed to you because it gives you the capability to not only see what's in the server logs, but for example, to look into the networking, uh, telecommunication equipment, and, and be able to get additional uh, intelligence from, uh, from that. Um, uh, what, what I do, of course, a big uh, open source fan, so Linux, I like, uh, uh, even though I run Kali on my, uh, on my notebook, uh, I'm, I'm a big uh, Debian, Debian fan just because of the stability and, and uh, sort of uh, putting in what, what I need, uh, not having something pre, uh, predefined. Uh, some of the things uh, I uh, like to use it for is uh, basically to send out personalized messages. Yeah, so uh, when I talked about tracking, uh, when I can communicate with somebody dig digitally, uh, I want to be able to, I want to get some feedback. Did they look at it? Uh, uh, did they look at it a lot? Or, 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 or did they totally ignore it? So, so maybe I call them and I say, hey, look, look at this uh, information I have sent you because uh, I think it's worth, uh, worth looking at. Um, it has another uh, function. If you, if you customize the messaging and, and, and you send out some, some email, some, some information, is you can actually get uh, uh, idea of the infrastructure that's uh, on the other side. Yeah? So, so through the packets and through analyzing the be it browser or, or some add-ons or, or how it behaves, you can actually get some interesting information how the other side is running the, uh, the equipment. It, it helps to, uh, with the communication. And, and part of the platform that I have is I have semi-automated, uh, uh, let's say, emailing. It's, it's not spamming. I don't spend some thousands of, uh, of emails, but I can send Hundred emails, no, no problems. It's uh, it's assisted. I can put in PDFs inside it that are very specific. Ahoy, Tomash. Uh, here's uh, here's the contract I have sent for you, or here's the invoice. Uh, uh, let me know if you have any any issues. A uh, lot of the things that I that I do is. Uh, uh, basically, I look at the, uh, the server log, yeah? and, and, and typically when, when you look at the log, what's most important or interesting is, is the 200 uh, status quo uh, 
status code uh, because it tells you, yeah, the, the information gets transferred, uh, everything is okay. But uh, um, looking more at the logs, interesting is, for example, the 206 uh, code because that tells you a little bit more information of what is happening on the other side. So, uh, for example, a 206 code can mean uh, a bot uh, downloaded part of the content and they only maybe wanted a header. Uh, or it can mean, uh, for example, I have a long, long video, well, not long, it's, it's let's say a gigabyte video on, on my web page. When somebody goes to the web page uh, and they, they leave, I basically get with the uh, 206 code the last timestamp uh, when the download st stopped. Yeah? So, so you get a little bit of a measurement of how long that individual was on the web page. Yeah? Did it download uh, all of it? No, but it, it, it was still downloading when they left a minute and a half later. So uh, it, it, it's, uh, uh, the status codes can, if, if you start looking at them and, and understand the behavior of, of, of browsers, uh, can be uh, very interesting to tell you a story, what is happening on the other side. Yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of uh, 404 code. Yeah, so <laughs> uh, not available. Uh, I like to send out links uh, to files that are not existent uh, because the other side tries to retrieve them and uh, uh, there's no, uh, no information, but at least I see the message that they try to uh, retrieve them. Yeah, uh, one interesting thing is if, if you put in an email message, uh, uh, one picture and, and one uh, 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 missing link uh, and, and uh, use the source, um, a command, the, the mobile or, or the, the, the service tries to pull the, the picture. So one time they pull the actual picture, the other time they don't pull the picture. And some applications, they stop after getting the image, but uh, they're still trying to get the other image. So you, you get still feedback or they're still trying to or, or they still see the, the message. So there's certain types of uh, log behavior that you, uh, you get when um, uh, you look at what is happening with the 404s, and, and I like to put in uh, uh, lots of 4 codes in my, in my script. Yeah? Um, I like uh, uh, to discuss maybe this a uh, little bit this uh, email uh, use case, uh, how I like to basically play around and, and, and get some intelligence on the other side. I, I think I could talk about it probably for, for a few hours, but in principle, what, what we have is we have uh, one part that is totally under your control, so what you send out, what is stored on your, your device, and, and nobody, or, or very difficultly, somebody can, can access it. Once it leaves your, your port, once it leaves your computer, then you're transiting that information, and that information uh, basically any big party has access to it, it gets logged, it gets archived. Uh, it can try to be decrypted if you encrypt it, and if you're a person of interest enough, then enough resources will be probably put into place to decrypt it, and eventually it will get decrypted of what you send. But uh, that's, sort of, that's sort of an extreme. So, so the transit is more or less, more or less safe, but uh, we know there's uh, 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 basically the data is being captured somewhere. And then we have the destination, and the destination, we don't really know how good the security on the other side is, yeah? Uh, uh, they could have the best security, or, or, or they could have some free, free service, so when you send it to somebody you trust and they have a free service, uh, you will find out that you know Google has all the information. They read it two times before the actual person person read it. Yeah, and then, well, if you don't want to, you know, leave your stuff with with Google, then you know this could be a problem. Uh, so uh, basically, the idea is you, you send an email, you, you send the, the information, uh, the, the critical information in the link. Uh, the other destination receives it. When they click the link, they get the information from, from your server, and uh, uh, it basically increases a little bit uh, how much information is actually exposed for, for the future because you can always deactivate that information in your server. If they didn't save it, then typically uh, it, it, gets, uh, it gets lost. It doesn't sit in the email box for four years for somebody to hack the email box and, and, and to get all the details that are in the email box because the attachment is actually in, uh, uh, in the link. So here I have um, 
recently, I, I've, I've started playing around a little bit with, uh, with LinkedIn. I've, I've had LinkedIn about 15 years ago, then I know 12 years ago, my password got uh, reset, I lost all the information, I stopped using it. And uh, uh, I started using it uh, about, uh, I don't know, eight months ago. And, and of course, the first thing what I thought is, hey, can I put in a link? To, to, my, to my server. And here's an example of something that I have sent out uh, on Thursday, where basically when you connect uh, to somebody, you can put in a message, so you can see I put in a, a link. Um, I did not create a, a dummy uh, uh, or, or a 404, but I, I decided I want to really put in a CV so, so it's authentic because maybe I will be talking to them, maybe there's a job position behind there. But what I did is uh, after the last slash, if you put a question mark, you put some attribute, in my case link, uh, makes sense, equals, and then you put the name, for example, for the person, well, it, 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 it's tagging them. Yeah? I, mean, I mean, nowadays, uh, who basically takes the link, shortens it to, to what they think is, is realistic, and, and and leaves out the tag, yeah, everybody clicks on the tag. So uh, I basically know before uh, 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 I look on LinkedIn, when somebody has uh, uh, connected to me, uh, and, and I know it because uh, I see LinkedIn basically accessing it. When, when LinkedIn then basically when they get connected uh, in the last page, LinkedIn does a very nice thing is they actually scan the, the, the link, they, they do the 206 that I talked about, they, they get the header and, and then they fill in uh, basically bottom of the email. So uh, I mean as far as providing uh, um, uh, a, a link, this is a pretty trustworthy link, right? It's, it's my name, my domain, uh, it, it's a humanly readable CV for you, and, and uh, it has uh, uh, just some, some reference. Um, so what, what actually happens in, 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 in the back end? So uh, the, on the left-hand side, we have uh, uh, the actual uh, LinkedIn uh, uh, connecting, and on the uh, right-hand side, we have an interesting thing that LinkedIn does is after somebody connected to me and, and after LinkedIn reads through and, and tries to uh, decode uh, what is behind the link, they actually go to my profile, they look at all the uh, web references I have in the, in the profile and they also scan those. So if I had uh, five different uh, uh, URLs in, in my profile, then I would get automatically scanned each time all five, uh, five references. Um, I think this is a pretty good example to see how you can detect uh, bot behavior from, from human behavior. Yeah, what, what we have is at the, at the top we have the IP address 108 and the IP address 108 basically means it's the LinkedIn server trying to get the information that was on the uh, footer of, of the previous slide. Uh, then we see uh, they start reading from a different IP, uh, they start reading uh, the actual link, the document, and then uh, about, I don't know, sixth, no, no, about tenth line down, we see, we see a CV Marek Hensel, uh, that they actually downloaded my, my CV, this is a bot, but then we see that we have some, uh, some numbers behind it, and that tells me that this is a, a bot, because uh, the way the page is designed is once they uh, uh, basically download my file, uh, the whole process should stop. And, and basically what they did, they split it, and they downloaded my file, and they're continuing to look what else they can, uh, they can find. Um, uh, on the, on the right-hand side, uh, basically there's also some indicators of, and I guess we don't have enough, uh, enough time today to, to go into details, but some indicators that show why it is a bot. And, and interesting enough is um, uh, the LinkedIn uh, server, for example, has a hover function, so they actually fake that they have a cursor there and that it's hovering some, somewhere, yeah? So, uh, uh, it's interesting, if, if, if I summarize it, uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, there's two IP addresses that typically show up. The, fir the first one is the LinkedIn, and that one only happens when somebody is connecting to me, uh, th and, and they actually open up the uh, messaging part. Uh, there's another way where they can click and, and connect, uh, but they don't go into the messaging, and in that case, that doesn't show up uh, until they actually go into the messaging. Uh, the other part is uh, basically uh, it goes to, uh, to this robot in, in Microsoft, and Microsoft uh, basically scans everything. Uh, I think uh, one interesting point is, is if you look at the um, uh, user agent of the Microsoft bot, uh, they're actually hiding 
who they are. Uh, I don't know if this is really, really kosher. The first one says, yeah, I'm a LinkedIn bot. The second one is acting like a normal uh, Microsoft user. Yeah. The, the question, and, and when I said with uh, looking at the uh, uh, you know, metadata, the CSS, easy metadata, you can actually get insight into the infrastructure that is behind and where is the data actually being um, pulled to. Yeah? And, and it's very clear that LinkedIn is, is obviously not following GDPR because the data is, is being pulled from, uh, from the US. Yeah? And, and this way you can actually verify who has which service behind and are they really localized to to EU or, or not. Um, we can uh, look at the, now let's look at some of the actual things that I do to, to, to enable this. So, so the first thing I like to do is to disable the, uh, the caching, yeah? Because the whole idea of CSS, uh, um, getting the data, getting the packets is, is to get as much requests, and, and you ideally want to have repeated requests. You don't want to have the cache, cache it up, and, and then not really tell your server that there's some activity between the user and, and, the, uh, and the proxy. So basically, the, uh, uh, one should look at and uh, get uh, uh, inform the transit and the destination that uh, they should not be caching it. You can, you can do it uh, in the web page, and on the top you have an example on the web page. You can also do it on the uh, virtual host uh, through, for example, HT uh, access. Then uh, a lot of the things I like to do and, and play around is, uh, is uh, the, the refresh, yeah? And the, the refresh is uh, in interesting. I mean, you can use it to uh, redirect uh, permanently some, some content. You can uh, use it to uh, uh, sort of help to avoid uh, some of the bots reading your information. Not every bot follows the, the, the redirect. There's a different uh, application and use cases for uh, using the uh, request. Uh, but uh, I, th I think there's two, two interesting points. Is, is one, to, to maybe start, stop a bot, you, you put a zero uh, time uh, redirect. So, so as soon as the page gets read, it redirects right away. And, and uh, hopefully, you filter out some of uh, unwanted robots. The, the other one is to, for example, put in a one second. And, and see what happens in the one second before you uh, redirect. Yeah? So, for example, the. Um, uh, LinkedIn example, I had a one second redirect, so the idea is after one second the page, web page is gone and they should not be checking continuously what is in the next, uh, next function. They basically close down the, uh, the, the web page. Uh, I like to use iframes. Uh, iframes are good because you can isolate the, the, the content and, and you can use additional uh, headers. Yeah, So you can have uh, 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 different types of CSS files that are uploaded that are maybe contradictory uh, because you put it in the iframe and then you can watch what is being downloaded and then make some calculation, make some, make some analysis. There's, for example, the, uh, the clock function, which is basically using an, an iframe that has a few, uh, a few files behind it, which are being redirected. Uh, uh, the top is uh, really what's, uh, what's needed, the, the part that is in the uh, header or head uh, tag. But here you have uh, the whole um, uh, script if you actually want to show the time. And, and the time you can see on the um, uh, right hand uh, bottom, bottom side. This is sort of interesting to, without any JavaScripts, to be able to see how long the user is on the, on the web page. So I start with uh, one second, four seconds, 10, 15. So basically I go one second, five seconds, they stayed 15 seconds, they stayed 30 seconds, they stayed one minute, and then I can see how many minutes they stayed. With, uh, with this script, because it keeps refreshing the time. You can, for example, see when somebody closed down their, their notebook and then reopened it. You can see if, if they went from one network to, to the other one. So you can get some interesting insight of what is happening, in, uh, again, in the, in the background. 
uh, or I do a I do a refresh. Yeah, I I I, I put in uh, say the one second and the uh, redirect. I refresh the page as much as possible, and here you can actually measure the distance and and the performance of of the other side. So so if you're in North America, within the one second, maybe you only get two refresh. If you're on the local network, uh, you probably get 30, and if you're somewhere in Europe, maybe you get uh, 10, uh, 10 refreshes. We have hover uh, function. Uh, so this is basically to be able to say where the user on the page is uh, uh, hovering through. Yeah, you can identify if it's a mobile or a, a desktop because they behave a little bit differently. Uh, mobile, they have the focus uh, uh, tag that gets triggered. Uh, hover uh, uh, gets triggered by, uh, by desktop. Yeah, and, and with the hover, function, you can put it in uh, over any element, so you can see different elements. Uh, you only get the trigger from CSS, uh, CSS once, but uh, uh, if you put it in an iframe, then you can refresh that specific frame, and, and then you can, you know, five minutes later, still be able to see the person is going over that uh, uh, field. And again, it helps you detect, is this a person or is this a, is this a bot? Uh, the last, uh, the last one I've uh, started to play with is uh, the at media uh, tag. Yeah, you can uh, define uh, and and basically have a, a request for. Uh, URL based on the screen dimensions. You don't need JavaScript to be able to calculate for you how what the dimensions are. Uh, you basically get the CSS to request a specific uh, non-existent image, and by that uh, request, depending on the resolution, you can to your back end get the uh, resolution of uh, of the screen. So, uh, unfortunately, I had some troubles uh, connecting at, at the beginning, and. Uh, 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 had to a little bit speed it up, but uh, nonetheless, this is uh, just a summary of uh, some of the things you can do with very basic uh, uh, fundamental uh, HTML, CSS uh, scripts to be able to see what is happening behind, to get intelligence of uh, what is uh, on the other side, and to be able to uh, use that uh, data to make uh, things uh, 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 more interesting, or, or, or to even protect your data, because you see who's looking at it, and, and then you can take the mitigation. So thank you very much uh, for your attention, and uh, if you have any questions, I'm, I'm open to them.